Time Hunter, The Albino's Dancer by Dale Smith, read by Terry Malloy. Prologue, 8th of April, 1938, 7.03 a.m. Honoré Lechasseur stood at one edge of a great scar in the black earth of London and looked down briefly at the ground. Overhead, grey clouds let a fine drizzle fall down on him. The city slept, but not he. Goodbye, little Emily, Honoré said, over the makeshift grave. Chapter One Fourth of November, 1951 6.12 p.m. They said if you wanted to eat well in England, you should eat breakfast. At least Honoré thought they said it. If they didn't, they would. Breakfast, lunch, or dinner, so they'd say, or already had. If you were in England, it was breakfast time. Honoré could appreciate that. For him, time was moody and unreliable, coiling itself like a cobra and daring him to tame it. Day didn't always follow night, and lunch wasn't always followed by dinner. It was six in the evening, and Honoré was eating breakfast, almost as if to prove his point. The serving boy had made no comment. They all knew Honoré here, and were used to the hours he kept, besides which he was still a man who knew where to find a bit of bacon going spare. Six years on, and meat was still rationed, but Honoré knew it wouldn't last. The point system had gone now, and the rest wouldn't be far behind. Soon you'll be able to get all the meat you needed delivered to your door by the butcher's boy, and bacon wouldn't need much help to get found. The rest of the café didn't care. A few young kids hovered around the counter because John the Till would sometimes sell them a snifter or two if the police weren't watching too close. At the tables were seated distinct islands of gnarled little men, all trying to hide themselves behind a nicotine smoke screen. Why were they here? and not in the sportsman. Honoré couldn't say, but wouldn't ask. Perhaps that alone was the reason. There couldn't be anywhere better to hide in London that night. The air in the café was a greasy fog, the lights on the tables barely smears. Honoré stuck his knife into his sausage and cut himself a bite. Perhaps this would be the last one he'd eat that he'd provided. It tasted fatty. Mr. Lechasseur, said a voice. Honoré chewed his sausage and wondered whether to look up or just run. In his business a stranger wasn't always a friend you hadn't met. But he was loath to leave his breakfast. He never knew when his next decent meal might be, so instead he looked up. A tall woman of about twenty looked down at him. Her outfit was designed for a warmer night than this, a light summer coat and a long dress too thin to stop the goose flesh from rising on her arms. To be honest, Honoré couldn't imagine where such a wisp of a dress would keep her warm. Certainly not on the streets of London, with her legs and belly showing like that. Her hair was auburn and neatly bobbed, and, despite the darkness outside, she wore thin-framed glasses with smoky grey lenses. Honoré didn't like not being able to see her eyes. It made him nervous. She placed a newspaper down on the table in front of him, which in itself wasn't an unusual opening gambit. Whispers of Honoré's abilities were starting to spread through London. Here was a man who could find bacon without too many questions. He had started to attract grey-haired, broken men, showing him obscure stories from newspapers decades old and asking if he could help. He generally feigned ignorance, but that wouldn't be necessary on this occasion. The paper was that morning's mirror, and anything inside would be taken to the police, 
or one of the more well-known investigators. The here and now weren't Honoré's speciality. Without asking, the woman sat down opposite. Honoré pretended to be more interested in the paper. They'd finished the clean-up after the festival on the South Bank. Attlee's brainchild, it had tried to remind Britain of its former glories, spur her on to future successes. Honoré hadn't bothered going. He couldn't get nostalgic for the past any more than he could have hope for the future. Both were too immediate for that. "'It's terrible, isn't it?' said the woman. He almost asked her to be more specific. The news was generally so bad it wasn't just the country slipping into a depression. But his eyes fell on the main story. British troops were being sent into Egypt, and British families being sent out. Something Attlee had failed to see. Britain's empire was crumbling all around her, and the war had left her without the stomach to keep hold of it. Perhaps that was why they had voted Churchill back in, hoping he could push them to victory in another fight they didn't want to have. If things continued like this, soon Britain would survive only because it clung on to the coattails of America. And the city knew it. People had always treated Honoré with caution when they heard his faded Louisiana lilt. Now they glared at him like all this grime and dirt was his personal fault. The woman was still staring at him, as if expecting an answer. It is... Mr. Lesher, sir, isn't it? she said. That depends, Honoré said cautiously. He set his fork down on his plate, but his knife stayed in his hand. The woman looked confused. You can't have forgotten, she said emphatically. Honoré resisted the temptation to retort. You saved my life. Honoré looked at her face again. The smoke glasses weren't confusing him. She was nothing but a stranger. He nodded slowly, setting his knife down next to his fork. I guess that's not just a figure of speech, he sighed, motioning for the greasy boy behind the counter to bring more coffee. When?